the fear has gone out of the general public. The craft is more and more acceptable. Paganism has infiltrated the mainstream thought pattern of most Americans today. There is a pagan revival. There are more people practicing true paganism than there are practicing true Christianity. Many people were seeking something apart from Christianity. The thing that attracts young people is the power, and it's immediate power. Different. You know what you are? Say it. Vampire. Whenever you drink blood, you gain incredible power. We choose only to let the general public see what we want them to see. Magic is about getting what you want. Magicians are people who get what they want. Slowly but surely, the beauty of the craft is becoming widespread. I'm not scared of you. You really shouldn't have said that. Black is not evil in any way. Psychic vampirism and physical vampirism were very viable ways of achieving power in black magic. But why hide it in this day and age? I've hidden in the shadows for centuries. It's time to share myself with the world. I'm very proud to be a witch. We live in a kind of post-Christian era. People are moving towards a kind of neo-paganism. The neo-pagan revival has uh, proceeded so rapidly. They have had the uh, cooperation of the media in, in getting their message spread. I wanna do bad things with you. A lot of what we do has been taken over by the church. Christians really have married into occult practices. They no longer know the difference because they've become desensitized to the things of evil. Are you afraid? No. The Satanists have merely followed the pantheist way of thought to its logical conclusion. If there are no absolutes, if God doesn't exist, he hasn't said, uh, set absolute limits to what we can do. So therefore, anything that the self decides it wants, the self can go after. We believe in greed, we believe in selfishness, we believe in all of the lustful thoughts that motivate man because this is man's natural uh, feeling. I think it can be put in one four-letter word, lust. There is a, a lust for power that is part of our sinful nature. C.S. Lewis talks about it as a spiritual lust, of, of spiritual itch to want to somehow reach into the unknown. We're fascinated by it. It's why horror movies and horror books are so popular. The thing that attracts young people is the power, and it's immediate power, immediate results. And this is very attractive because the people that fall into the trap of the occult are normally people that are majorly rejected. Then the devil comes and says, you are not rejected. You are actually very special. Immediately, Satan gives them power because he doesn't need very much. He just needs somebody curious. And um, he'll use that and he'll be the light for them because he needs vessels as well. In my case, at least, it was a gradual infiltration. It was a move from very innocent things like ESP and flying saucers, and then just a very gradual, many-year slide into finally regarding Satan as my god. All religions are coming around to Satanism. We're in the uh, very throes of a new satanic age. The evidence is all around us. All we have to do is look at it. Shemham Barash! Shemham Barash! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! The real Satanists, the hardcore Satanists, are involved in criminal activity, and for that reason they are going to try and look as normal as possible, the better to be able to deceive you. Occult is a very serious thing. Many people take it very lightly, like it's a game, but it's a very serious matter. There are certain holidays that people consider them like Christian festivities, but their root are in the occult. And there's a lot of people just practicing it without knowing they're entering into the occult. And uh, one of it is uh, Halloween. 
Halloween is the second biggest holiday of the year. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. In a three month period, we plan on doing over a half million in sales at this store. With Halloween being a pagan holiday, Halloween's getting more and more dangerous. So now a lot of the churches around here in Jacksonville are doing trick or trunk and other Halloween activities to bring the kids in from them being on the streets. We're a big supporter of the churches to keep the kids safer on Halloween. It's a holiday that uh, was made a part of the church calendar early on during the Middle Ages. It came into uh, prominence as an effort of uh, the churches to uh, reach out to the secular culture. In, in its modern terms, it's gener generally regarded as a kind of harmless uh, kids festival and candy harvest. But it has, it has much deeper roots and uh, Halloween is changing its face today as some of the influences from those deeper roots are coming to the surface. People think that, oh, well, that is just a trick or treat, and we just have the children disguise. And the origin of all of that is the Druids. And they, they actually invoke a lot of spirits to go with the people. And if they don't give them things, actually the demons will enter the homes and will do all kind of destruction. And today we see all these homes of, of nice people, even Christians that hang in their doors like phantoms or in skulls, and they don't know they're really cursing their homes. They're inviting spirits of death. They're spir inviting spirits of occult because this is not a game. They're real demonic spirits involved in Halloween. In the larger culture, Halloween has become a focal point of some uh, very negative uh, forms of spirituality. It has become a big celebration for the gay community and of course uh, the neo-pagan uh, community and the witchcraft community have made it a major uh, celebration of their liturgical year, uh, which on uh, some witchcraft calendars uh, begins at Halloween. I love Halloween. We dress up the house with cobwebs and so on, and we cast a circle, and we open the gates of the underworld. And if any spirits want to come forward and speak, we listen to them. If the trend continues, if we do indeed continue to see a resurgence of the pagan spirit in society, one of the things we're going to see is that groups not directly related to each other are going to recognize uh, their common source. One of the uh, manifestations we see of this already is uh, what has come to be called the Burning Man Festival. This festival has become intensely popular as 50,000 people gather each year in the Nevada desert. As each ticket is nearly $300, this festival caters to the middle class, branding itself as an experimental community of artists and revealing many facets of the neo-pagan movement. But the general theme of the uh, Burning Man Festival is a complete anarchistic license. There are no rules about how one must behave at this event. Rather, it is up to each participant to decide how they wish to express themselves. This creed attracts people who wish to abandon any kind of restraints that they feel society has imposed on them, indulging in bizarre and outlandishly hedonistic behavior. Some of the things they do, you wouldn't want to see on film and probably wouldn't even want to hear about. Some of the milder things that can be mentioned is uh, our uh, initiation, magical initiations by uh, uh, dousing a person in animal's blood, uh, divination by means of uh, uh, sacrifice, disembowelment, and examining the intestines of uh, uh, the sacrificed animal and uh, various forms of public sexual demonstration that are uh, best left unmentioned. And that's just for starters. All of it done under the general rubric of paganism. Most of the people who are there regard themselves as pagans. This festival pays homage to the ancient Wickerman bonfire ritual, 
whose druidic roots involved human sacrifice. There was one report of a woman throwing her infant into the bonfire in Black Rock, Nevada, fortunately rescued by an onlooker before any serious harm was incurred to the baby. So what does the Bible have to say about paganism? Well, first of all, in the Ten Commandments, it forbids the worshiping of any other God except God Almighty. In the book of Isaiah, it talks about idols. It says, do not fear them. They can do you no harm, nor can they do you any good. In other words, idols have no effect. They're just pieces of wood. In the book of Psalms, it says, they have hands without feeling and feet without power for walking and no sound comes from their throat. Those who make them are like them, and so is everyone who puts faith in them. God says idols are worthless, and those who make them are stupid. Reminds me of Forrest Gump. Stupid is as stupid does. There's a very appealing side to paganism. Lucifer doesn't always come as the boogeyman, but he often comes as an angel of light, promoting all kinds of interesting concepts, particularly in the area of self-help, like in the book, The Secret. We're gonna show you the secret and the secret behind the secret. This may amaze you. The best-selling self-help book of our time is The Secret, which offers its readers unlimited prosperity by harnessing the power of the universe using the law of attraction. We're all working with one power, one law, it's attraction. attraction. Basically, the message of The Secret is the message that I've been trying to share with the world on my show for the past 21 years. You are the designer of your destiny, and the outcome is whatever you choose. I was able, because of this kind of technique, to bring my wife to me. I simply got a picture of a girl and kind of my ideal woman, and I put it on uh, my little altar that I had in my bedroom, and I just went every night and I just visualized her. I did certain spells, and lo and behold, after about six months, I met her, and she looked amazingly like the picture. When you visualize, then you materialize. Visualization plays a very important part in the craft. When you get a group of people together in a circle, and they're doing a spell, the visualization is important because it brings everybody together doing the same thing at the same time. Some Christians are taught that this kind of technique can be used to acquire either physical or spiritual things. They, they believe that if, if they want a Cadillac, they take a picture of the, of the Cadillac and they put it on their refrigerator and every time they see that, they say, I claim that Cadillac in the name of Jesus. And the trouble with that is, is it's precisely like what I was doing as a witch. Visualize it. And then from your very solar plexus, feel that power working. Make it a powerful memory, the happiest you can remember. Allow it to fill you up. Build the power up within your own body. This is really advanced stuff, guys. You're doing so well. And start to direct it so that you may create the cone of power. You would be within the circle which is where you have all your power and all your protection, then there would be a triangle placed within that. And from within that triangle was the most power. And what we do with it, with that cone of power, it, the moment we go down, it goes... <laughs> it's gone. Where does it go? How does magic work? We don't know. But it does. <laughs> We really don't know. All we know is that we bring it into consciousness and we say, this is our will. We will it. Now, if you don't understand it, doesn't mean you should reject it. Our job is not to figure out the how. The people behind the book, The Secret, say, well, we don't really know how it works. It just works. Well, hey, I would want to know what was in my Kool-Aid before I drank it. We were approached by an energetic individual named T.J. Lanier, who dared to figure out the how behind The Secret and brought with him investigative research tracing back to its original source. We are sitting with the author, uh, Mr. Dennis William Hawk. For us, we just kind of want to know what makes you an expert on this, on this topic. I uh, have been studying the Emerald Tablet, uh, researching it, translating it uh, for the last 30 years. Now, in the secret, they show this symbol. It's in the backdrop. Did you catch it? Yeah. When you watch yeah. it? 
Explain this. This is the Azoth of the Philosophers. It actually has the stages of the Emerald Tablet embodied in these alchemical symbols. The idea was that man is able to be perfected into a god. Right, simple answer. You want to know who is God? I am. The whole magical concept is that God is everywhere. Uh, this is not an exclusively Wiccan concept. You are God manifested in human form, made to perfection. There is a divine nature in us that we can bring out by working with the Emerald Tablet. But what is the Emerald Tablet? Uh, the Emerald Tablet is according to uh, historical documents, is an actual tablet. And Toth wrote the Emerald Tablet. Toth was a god in ancient Egypt with his own city, uh, Hermopolis. All sacred writings of ancient Egypt were attributed to Thoth. Now, of course, the priests who wrote them know perfectly well that Toth didn't write them, but they thought that faculty in themselves which inspired them to write such things was, in a way, participation in the mind or being of, of Thoth in some way. Thoth was associated with magic uh, quite early on, but it, in the Ptolemaic period, when the Hermetica were being written, it becomes associated with other things that are now of interest, for example, astrology. Also, uh, alchemy appears at this time. Alchemy very much associated with uh, Thoth. Later, when the Persians conquered Egypt and were thrown out by Alexander the Great, Toth becomes transformed a little bit. He mm. becomes now Hermes Trismegistus. Mm. When we talk about the Emerald Tablet, which is the wisdom behind the secret, this wisdom comes from this god called Hermes Trismegistus, which is actually the wisdom of Satan. But as you start to learn about the Emerald Tablet and Thoth, there are some visual similarities that your mind starts to say, well, these sounds a lot like the concept of the serpent and the apple. Because the serpent was offering the wisdom of good and evil. Exactly. It, was, it was the knowledge. Let me just give you knowledge. He wasn't yeah. selling fruit. Uh -huh. And so here we have this god who is telling humans how to become their own gods. He's giving them the knowledge of good and evil. It's part of the teachings. And really, it's the secret that maybe people don't want to know. But the basic idea is that it's not evil. It's been painted as evil. So this is where the, the, the tie-in from Thoth to Hermes to Satan comes in. Yeah, It's because exactly. they're saying, it's the same guy. He was the serpent in the garden, and the apple was the emerald tablet. It was the available knowledge that yeah. they had not had up to this point. Uh, that's very true, and, and it's not... Um, it's not something that people accept easily. It's hard to swallow, but when we can begin to open ourselves up to that, the ramifications are awesome. There is no wisdom coming from the devil that is going to be for free. There is no power coming from the devil that is going to be for free. He's gonna offer you one solution, and it's gonna be great, something that works, you're fascinated with the power, and then the tragedy comes, and then the former Things that work for you in the beginning are not going to work anymore. You need to go deeper. When you meet witches or warlocks or people in the New Age or in the occult, they're always going to tell you how fantastic everything is, how great it is those ways, because that's what you are meant to teach to the people. That's what the devil expects you to proclaim, that his ways are fantastic. The New Age movement has infiltrated our society, so much so that it's in the church. For example, when we're in the church and a pastor uses the word karma and visualize yourself getting closer to the Lord, when it comes to even prosperity, see yourself with a bigger house, see yourself with a nicer car, see yourself with a million dollars in the bank. All that comes out of pagan practice. All that comes out of the occult. There are those who are into astrology, and yet they call themselves Christians. Even exercise. Uh, example, yoga. Yoga comes out of the Hindu religion, and a lot of the churches are holding yoga classes in the church. So the church has many variations of paganism, and they don't even realize it's paganism because sometimes the doctrines of men have intermingled with true biblical reality. What happens is people are so ignorant of these things that they allow it in their churches. 
they allow it in their homes, in their kids' books. Example, Harry Potter. There are a tremendous amount of parents that are allowing, and, they, and the parents themselves that are reading this and saying, oh, it's just a fiction novel, oh, it's just fiction. It's okay, there's nothing bad with that. When really there is very much so just the darkness of witchcraft and the darkness of magic in that. And their kids are having it in their home at the same time going to Sunday school. Spirits cannot affect you unless you give them permission and authority. And the problem with the church now is that they've given the spirits and authority and the witches to come into their church. Just about the end of my satanic career, I was being trained to counterfeit the gifts of the spirit. I was enabled by my demonic spirits to have the power to read auras. They felt that I could manifest really good as a healer. I could turn to a person and say, you have a bad gallbladder or your kidneys are wrong, and they would just go, praise God, this guy has spiritual discernment. And what they didn't know is that I was seeing that in their auras, I wasn't seeing it by the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And they were gonna send me into one of the most vital churches in our area to try and just totally tear down the church. Since the beginning, the devil is a counterfeiter. He wants to produce something that is so similar to what God does in order to deceive people. The very root or the essence of counterfeit is not the opposite of truth. It's what it looks like the truth. If, I, if the devil comes or someone comes and offers you a hundred dollar bill that is red, you're not going to take it. You know it's, it's fake. But if you, if you receive a hundred dollar bill that is green, that it looks exactly like the real one, but the series are different, then you're going to be deceived. I know what it is, the power of the devil, and I know what it is, the power of God. And the power of God is so much greater. It's like comparing a bean with a football field. It's, it's comparing the planet Earth with a cockroach. That's the level the devil can operate. It's, it's all through the Bible. We see Jesus being able to cast out the legion of demons that was in one man. I mean, many times in the ministry, we are attacked or, or surrounded by, by people of the occult that want to harm us, and they get so scared. I have seen them just running away, scared, and they say they don't understand what's going on, but they can feel a presence that they cannot come against. They can feel a presence that will destroy them if they remain there. They just cannot resist the power of God. They all know that they can only go up into a certain point before they are touched by the true fire. And it's only when you get the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's when you see that all that, as powerful at it, as it seemed, it was not powerful at all when it came to the power of the Lord. Now there's power in other demonic spirits, but please understand they're not gods, they're demons. So though they have a power, how could they ever compete with the God of the universe? It's impossible. He created everything. So when you call on the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and you use that name to break the power of the enemy, it will be broken. But as Christians, it's not just about what we say. It's about where we are. It's not where we talk, but from what place we're talking from. And if we talk from a heart that is totally bond with Jesus. The power is so extraordinary that no power of a cult can come against you. And there's a lot of people that just know Christ in their minds. And God is urging, urging Christians to get their acts together, to stop playing church. I came to the occult by a former opera singer and he said you have to be given to the spirit of death you have to die to everything that is mundane in this world so you your soul can be lifted up to the higher dimensions of magic and i fell in the trap my family and just the generations before me our culture is brujeria from the time i can remember i was able to do things like move things without ever touching them or 
just know things about people, see things. And in my family, that was normal. The first sort of witchcraft I got involved with was, uh, oddly enough, through the mail, I had gotten a book about Alex Sanders, the self-proclaimed king of the witches, and it, it resonated deeply within me, and so I, I wrote to the address in London and uh, got some information. I got a series of courses. Then, by the time I was in college, I was deeply involved in it. I had begun experimenting with seances. I had a, an extensive amount of demon and, and influence in my life by the time I had started to make the transition from what was called white witchcraft to black witchcraft. Uh, almost every move in my life that I made was, was governed by and controlled by demons either through divination or else through direct communication with these beings. They would tell me what to do and I would do it and they would very subtly, very gradually guide me into deeper and deeper patterns of evil. And always being tormented by demons. I was always tormented. It wasn't something fun, even though I could do these things. It wasn't anything fun. At that time, made it very clear that if I really wanted to progress much further, I would have to sell my soul to the devil. So that's what I did. After a little bit of soul searching, I decided if he was the true God, then why not give him my soul? You know, so I, I made a pact with the devil. Little by little, I found out there were things the devil could not do. And I faced the devil and I asked him, why do you say you are almighty and you cannot do these things? And he got so mad at me at that moment and he says, I'm going to kill you. I was already okay with taking my life because I knew that the things around me were going to take it and I was determined to not let them take me before I could take myself. And I actually lost my mind to the point that I, that I cut my veins, I tried to commit suicide, and I end up into a insane asylum where I was uh, locked for life. As I arrived to the, to the hospital, I was, I was bleeding. My sister took me to the hospital. I had sent in a check to the uh, Church of Satan at one point just to pay my yearly dues. And when it came back from the bank, some lady had written on it, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus. At that point, it was like someone just pulled the plug on my satanic power. And I just couldn't figure out what had happened because I'd sold my soul to the devil. I mean, I was supposed to have all these years of prosperity and, and wine, women, and song, and everything I wanted. And here it was like Satan was being a welcher. What I didn't realize is that God had been invoked through intercessory prayer of believing Christians and that, that it was totally crimping my style as a magician. The devil doesn't love those who follow him. He hates them. Not because someone is in the, in the lines of the devil. That means the devil is going to protect him. He's going to take care of him. He's going to give him everything he wants. That's the deception. The next thing that happened was is that Mormon missionaries showed up at our door. And because of the preconceptions we had been given by our witchcraft leaders, we welcomed them in. We figured this was the sign we needed. And so we, we were very quickly baptized into the Mormon church. Two days later, there was this man that came to the hospital and he was a Christian pastor. Something entered that room that it was like the truth entered that hospital room. And when I saw his eyes, something cleared in my mind just by the presence that man was carrying. And he was preaching to me and he said one thing. He said, Jesus is the truth. He's the way and he's the life. And something hit me really deep. After four years in the Mormon church, I was given the job of teaching a, a uh, institute class in the New Testament. And that forced me for the first time in my life to confront the biblical truth about salvation and about Jesus Christ. I read the book of Romans and was astounded to find what was in there. I think for the first time, probably because so many Christians were praying for me, my eyes were open to the scriptural truth that indeed, you know, there is nothing that we can do to be saved. There is no way we can work our way to heaven. I knew that this was the only thing I had left was Jesus. And after that, the next morning, I just gave my heart to the Lord. Finally, I decided that I, I had to do what the Bible said rather than what the Mormon leaders said. And I took off my temple garment and I asked Jesus Christ to come in and be my savior and take over complete control and be Lord of my life. 
And at that moment, for the first time in 16 years of incredible spiritual searching, I knew peace. I knew what it was to have a friendship with God Almighty in the character of Jesus Christ. And I said, today is the saddest day in my life because I am hearing the truth and I cannot come out of your cult. I have made covenants with the devil that are so strong that I cannot break them. And the words that came out of that man is the blood of Jesus broke every covenant with the devil. When I heard those words, after hearing so much, there is no way out, there is no way out, it was hope entering my life. And I fell on my face and I started to weep for my sins. And I saw Jesus in the cross. And I saw Jesus in the cross and it was like in his wounds, I was seeing all my sins. I was seeing my sin of witchcraft and all the sins I have committed were in every wound in him. And I cried and for the first time, I saw myself in the wickedness of the occult. I saw my spiritual being. I saw the filthiness of my face look so horrendous. It was the face of a witch. And I fell on my face crying and I said, Lord, if there is a little bit of mercy you can have on this sinner, please give me that drop of your life. And this man came and he lay his hands on my head and he said, your father is forgiving you and every sin is being erased from you. And he said, just simple as this, and every demon that is inside of you lives right now. The Lord is setting you free. In that precise moment, there was a light from heaven that came into that room. I felt like chains breaking off me. I saw myself like literally coming out from a cage where I was locked in. And the first thing I said is, I am free. I felt, I could feel like I could, I could fly in that moment. And for 12 hours, the glory of the Lord was there. I was sick to the bones and I was totally healed by his glory. My mind came totally, 100% back to me and the peace and the joy of the kingdom of God entered my soul. I was literally transformed from that precise moment. Once I found the revelation of Jesus, I had an instant love in me and I had a love for others. I have a peace in me now. I have freedom. There are no chains around me anymore. When you really find the Lord, you find His sweetness and His goodness. And then all you want to do is smile all day long. All you want to do is just tell people of how good He is and His love and His mercy. And that's one thing I really found in the Lord is mercy and grace. The love of the Father is so real. The love of the Father transforms. And every person that is in the occult is there because at the root cause of what make you enter that path is because your hunger for, for love, you're sick of rejection, you're brokenhearted, but the Lord is real and the Lord can touch your life right there where you are and change you forever. Jesus is real. Jesus is not just a philosophy. He's the light. He's the life. He is the power to change your heart and to break through in every circumstance that you need. And you don't have to pay anything. He paid for you.